welcome everybody. Welcome for this uh, session of Together Ensemble with UN Simple. We sense a kind of feeling of instability at the moment. And we did a poll uh, last week in a session of Together on somewhere people um, mentioned that the, the strongest feeling they had in, uh, in those times uh, towards the future was a feeling of uncertainty. Is it something um, like very new at the moment, this feeling of instability and uncertainty? I think the feeling is possibly new. The reality of uncertainty isn't. Um, I increasingly feel that we, we've fooled ourselves into thinking that we are more in control of life and the world than, than we are. And we've gone through a period of economic and um, there's been no wars, um, you know, a, a, long period, a longer period of stability than would be normal in a sense in history. Which, as I say, has seduced us into feeling that we're more in control than we actually are, and so um, that's just becoming apparent. You know, I, th I think, in a sense, you could see COVID as a sort of lesson from nature to uh, po poke a hole in our ra rather arrogant bubble of complacency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 this realization of uncertainty and instability, as you say, in a, in a way, it's not very new, but the feeling is. The, the yeah. feeling about this, I mean, it has become so uh, obvious uh, now that, um, as you say, we, we, we realize that nature is probably uh, yeah. more powerful than we are. <laughs> we, well, we, and, and, we, we thought we know, were powerful, but in general, right. not so much. That's right. I mean, it, it's you know, two and a half thousand years ago, but the Buddha just stated that change is constant and and everything's constantly in flux. Our bodies, the world around us, uh, everything's uh, growing or, or falling away. And, and I find it funny, I have found it funny for a long time that we talk about change in business as if it was something special and different and wouldn't be happening if we weren't there. And actually what most of business is about is preventing change, not starting it. And it's trying to hold back the apparent chaos of the natural organic growth of things. Um, and, that, and that's why we're feeling uncertain and that's why we're feeling that, that we've lost control because we've pretended we were in control for, for 50, 100 years. Uh -huh. Do you have a, a story perhaps to share in particular from your own experience? Because you're, you're I mean, you're still a change agent. Uh, I mean, considered a, a real expert uh, in the domain. And I wonder, do you have a story to share with us? Well, I suppose, I mean, uh, well, I, I don't see myself as that in this. You know, I, I don't, think, I increasingly don't feel I have the right to change anybody else. You know, I, I, I will talk about things that I've experienced and that I've seen and enjoy telling stories. And if, if that makes a difference to people and they hear them and they, they, they choose to, to do things differently, then that's, that's great. But it's not, you know, it's not my job, as it were. Um, and it was partly pulling back from that job the, the, as you know, I started driving large trucks, and uh, that sense of control. So I suppose the most po potent story was I was driving a 32-ton uh, mortar mix tank uh, into the city of London, and the sat nav was making its best effort to get me to a postcode, but the postcode was new because the building was new and blah blah blah. It's confusing. And the road that I went up to get to this site was was one way. And in order to have another attempt, I had to go back around a huge complex roundabout. And I had done this three times now. And I'm tired. Uh, I'm running out of time. I mean, a lorry driver's got very strict legal controls as to how long they can drive. And I, I'm running out of time and I've got nowhere to park. And I've lost control. Um, and I'm And I'm genuinely scared. And so, so I was on the point of literally parking the thing, taking the key out, phoning the agency up and saying, that's it, I can't, I can't do this. So it was a very visceral feeling that I hadn't experienced for a very long time of being out of control. I couldn't affect control, or at least that's what I thought. 
and I genuinely then started to apply some of the stuff I've learned through meditation, whatever else. That, that, that you're not out of control. You can you can move this vehicle another fifty yards, and then another fifty yards, and you can park and you can look at the map and you can calm down and you can decide that that map is right or wrong or whatever. So just those small micro decisions let me sort of pull back from this sense of chaos and loss of control. Um, and I think that, so, so inverting that in a sense, and back to your comment about me being some sort of expert or guru, guru, there's no absolute right way or wrong way to do things. All you can do is respond to the challenges as they present themselves to you each moment and, and, and do that to the best of your ability. Anything else is just made up stories. And so, so that for me was a very real, very visceral experience of situation where it kind of mattered as well. <laughs> when, when things seems, seem to become dysfunctional, like, you know, before we were pushing on a button and things seem to be uh, working in the right way, <laughs> according mm. to the, the button we pressed, um, there were this chain of uh, things happening sort of um, li in a linear way, let's say. Mm -hmm. And things were predictable. Now it seems like things get dysfunctional. Um, I mean, do you agree with that first? I would, I would take issue with the phrase, the word dysfunctional. Um, so just you describing that sort of confidence that you press a button and things happen in a linear fashion. Um, if I was in a business and I was in a managerial role or an operational role, that would really worry me now. Because if things happen in a totally predictable linear fashion, then there are technologies that will replace me. Um, you know, I, I think people underestimate, well, well technology is oversold and underdelivered for the last 50, 100 years. I mean, it may not happen as quickly as some people are predicting, but it's quite clear that if you're doing a repetitive, bureaucratic, writing-based, email-based function, there are already technologies that can do what you do, at least as well, if not better, for, for practically nothing. So, in fact, I think we want to be more interested in and curious about and capable of stepping off that predictable routine platform because that's where we as humans will add value. Um, you know, I called my last presentations staying ahead of the robots. And, and paradoxically, the way to stay ahead of the robots is to act in all the ways that you've been trained not to. You know, troublemakers at school were, were, were told off. Um, mavericks in the workplace were sort of disapproved of. Uh, people who asked too many questions or stood around talking instead of doing stuff were, were, were disparaged. But actually, they're the ones who will have jobs in 20 years' time. You know? And that, so I often talk about the, write a really interesting book about how we came out of a confidence in the sort of structures of society and, and religion, basically through the First World War and, and the, the trenches blew apart so much of that. And then that was sort of replaced by pseudo religions of, of uh, co communism and fascism, the, the big isms that, in a sense, carried us through the next war and the next period. Um, and since then, it's been materialism and consumerism and, and, and the myth of buy stuff till you die um, and, and getting jobs to be able to buy stuff. But now we're coming out of the end of that dream or that story where we're realizing, well, it's not making us happy, it's, it, it's destroying the planet. Um, there's more to us than the material world, and there's more that, 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 that we require to be happy than just stuff. Um, but so much of organizational life and business culture and education has been built around some of those very deeply held ideas. And people find it very challenging when that starts to get questioned or shaky. And, and I think what I think is because so fundamentalism happens because people are uncomfortable with that uncertainty. So they try to cling to sometimes older and out of date certainty. And I think it's understandable because we don't have another yet, another overarching sense making story that helps us get context and, mm -hmm. and make the That's micro judgments that we were talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in a way we would need a new, a new dream, a new story. Yes, and I, I wrote an article a few years ago that I called the ideology of algorithms. And it, it, it was around the fact that the technologies are, they're not neutral. 
and you know any algorithm has got a context a bias a reason for having been written it's based very often on problematic data sets that give it a, a skew this is why we see the racism and the sexism in so many bits of ai software um but i'm slightly mischievously at the end of it said well if our old isms are out of date and dying what if we got ai to write to write our next ism <laughs> what if it watched what we do, watched what caused stress or dysfunction? You don't want to eliminate stress because that's partly what helps us to grow and to learn about ourselves in the world. But, you know, an optimal sense of activities that, that globally AI could just say, right, if you all just do that, we'll be fine. Because what you were saying, you reminded me of a report. I was just on an article I was reading quite recently about the future of jobs in the era of AI. Mm-hmm. Um, and also what you're referring to about biases, there's been this film on Netflix called Coded Bias, which yeah. really, uh, really looked into that. But one of the things in the article they were talking about uh, was um, the core human abilities, such as empathy, imagination, creativity, and emotional intelligence, uh, which cannot be replicated by technology, will become more valuable. Would you, mm-hmm. would you agree with that? T- totally agree with that. Um... It's funny that you know that things are becoming mainstream and journalists are starting to catch up with them. But it, it, it's um, a lot of people aren't very good at some of those things you've just listed. Um, where to start with this? I, I think levels of consciousness and awareness are, are, are interesting and, and the degree to which we are asleep um, individually or collectively and, and, and have been trained to be asleep in a sense. And... So some of the cultural norms that make us think that something is dysfunctional, that was why I reacted to that word. That tends to just mean different. Um, but I was just on another uh, recording a podcast with a lady and we were talking about television and the norms of television behavior. And I confessed to ending up in tears at the end of the great British sewing bee, just because here was clever, thoughtful, nice people doing something that in itself was completely purposeless, but was revealing things about human nature and about them as people. And as a male in his early 60s, that that would be conventionally, I shouldn't admit that I was crying at a television program, you know? And I think there are so many constraints that we, we, we adopt, that we accept, that we place each other under about empathy and, and creativity and intelligence. And the creativity can only be special people um, empathy is a form of weakness or, or, or whatever. We, we, we underestimate the constraining power of some of those, those stories. One of the things that they were also mentioning in this article is that governments also need to refocus education systems mm-hmm. um, to yeah. develop so-called meta skills such as logical thinking, reasoning, curiosity, open-mindedness, collaboration, leadership, creativity and systems thinking. A more concrete example that worried me was with the UK approach to teaching computing in schools. And rightly, there was a concern expressed that all it was teaching was how to use Excel or PowerPoint, how to sit and shuffle bits of information that will be done by technology in the future. Um, We lurched from that to coding, that everybody has to learn to code. And I was thinking, well, what what about the bit in the middle about effective, appropriate, constructive, societally advantageous use of technology, the, the, the bigger picture, ethical, moral consequences of technology. That, that just got bypassed altogether. Um, and, and we still, you know, Julie will know this. I mean, when I meet senior folks, I get so frustrated when they sort of have this attitude of, oh, I don't do technology. You know, I, I have IT people who do technology. You, know, you can't do that anymore. It's, it's part of your professional responsibility. In fact, it's a legal responsibility these days for senior executives to understand cyber security enough to, to take that legal responsibility. But we need to broaden it to philosophers, um, moralists, you know, historians, creatives, whatever. People, it's life. Uh, and technology is at risk of overtaking us and swamping us if we still have this hands-off kind of attitude to it. So, so what you mean actually, you and is that technology should be a democratic uh, sort of process. I mean, designing the new technologies of the future should be democratic. We should have that. Have uh, that, that well, I think I think if, <laughs> there's another word that we could discuss: the, the democracy and democratic. I mean, I think certainly the future is too important to leave to a bunch of ADD geeks from California. That that's for sure. Um, I think how 
the democratic principles manifest themselves could potentially change quite radically. Uh, and this is why alongside all the stuff I read about Buddhist philosophy, I read a lot about anarchism, the original thinking of people like Kropotkin and mutual aid and about our ability as individuals to take thoughtful, responsible, collective decisions um, without the need. So we're sort of burdened with the whole moralistic nonsense of hierarchy. And if we don't have a manager to keep in control of us, we'll run them up and destroy the organization. You know, it's, it's nonsense. It's never been true, but it's been a prevailing mindset. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things about the technologies that with COVID and lockdown, uh, before Christmas, I did some workshops for an organization that had two significant locations, each with its own chief exec. And one chief exec thought this was all fantastic. It was allowing people to work to their strengths and optimize their productivity and just make decisions for themselves. The other one thought it was his worst nightmare because if he couldn't see what they were doing, how could he trust them when he didn't know what they were getting up to? You know? And sadly, the latter, I think, is probably still the prevalent attitude in most organizations. <laughs> What's the nodding from the two people from the division there? And so, so, so what you mentioned so far is that in a way we should design our technologies to fix the problems, um, the, the, the problems we, mm. we observe. Mm. I know, I don't think so, because I think what, what, what that means is that a small group of people then decide what the problem is. <laughs> okay. And we may not all agree with that, and then fix a problem that may not have been the problem. Um, no, I, I, it's sort of going back to my example of, of the driving situation, that, that I want technologies that allow me to make lots of small, more contextual decisions. This is what I love. I'm, I'm yeah. taking a risk using the beta of iOS 15 on, on my phone while we're doing the Zoom call. But what I love about it is it's getting much, much better. And not in a creepy way, and nobody's making use of the data except me of watching what I do and what I do regularly and just starting to nudge me and notice things and help me with things. Um, I'm still making the decisions, but I'm doing it with assistive technology. Um, and I imagine organizations where that could be the prevailing environment rather than having centralized IT with centralized office based tools and uh, data management systems that are based around a preconceived. I mean, you, you still need stuff like that. But the reason I'm so incredibly efficient is that they do stuff like that really well. So I'm not saying you just sweep away any structure or order or, or, or process, but certainly in terms of people-centered stuff and, and thinking stuff, um, you know, most so many people can't think unless they've got a PowerPoint in front of them. You know, that, that has to change. So we were talking about the, the session we did with uh, Stephen Preston, and Dave Snowden uh, recently about their, uh, the EU field guide to managing complexity and chaos during times of crisis. And you're, um, you've worked with Dave Snowden quite a lot. Well, we've worked with, we, we've, as I say, we, we, we've known each other for about 20 years and we, we climb hills as often as we can with each other and uh, sort the world out on a regular basis. Um, ding dong arguments about religion, but there you go. But uh, so Dave was, I, I got to know him first when I started doing knowledge management, whatever that means, at the BBC. And I'm always struck by something Dave said at that point, which is that you can't manage knowledge, you can create a knowledge ecology, which is the idea that you could instigate uh, interventions, events, technologies, behaviours that make it more likely that more people will share more effectively with each other. And it always struck me as a really interesting way of looking at bringing about change. And it's back to what we were talking about earlier about being curious and noticing. And you notice some tension or you notice some, some difficulty and you just make an appropriate timely intervention into that and that allows the system to recover and for people to work out and that that potential for people to work out what's required uh, there was a country in, in in the far east i think recently had a situation where their civil system the, the, the parliament just basically fell apart and became dysfunctional i wish i could remember where it was but uh, somebody who was tech savvy had the foresight to bring microphones into the senate building and allow the citizenry to hear the mess and to hear the challenges. And as was the case in the BBC with our systems, people would step forward and say, well, you don't need to do that. That doesn't need to be a mess. We could do this, we could do that. And all of a sudden opportunities and solutions start to emerge that otherwise, if you just had the people in a locked room being in charge, would never happen. So that, that kind of ad hoc guerrilla tactic intervention, I think has got huge prospects. 
in terms of coming back to nature, nature, uh, we discussed that um, we 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 sort of we were a bit arrogant, uh, thinking that we would do better than nature. Okay. How can we, in your views, how could we uh, not, of course, respect nature more, but do like nature, act like nature, spend more time in it? Uh, I love walking and hill walking and mountaineering and, and uh, but even just my local environment. I'm, you know, I'm very lucky. I live in a beautiful part of Britain and, and, and I have access to lovely countryside. But for my own sanity, I've realized that it is so important for me to spend time in nature with its rhythms and its patterns and, it, and, it, and, it, and my feeling of powerlessness in it. And I worry that so many people will spend their lives looking at screens in homes, in cars, in offices, uh, and are sort of hermetically sealed into this marketing constructed bu bubble of values. Um, I, so I, I think one of the consequences of lockdown has been more people have been more local and have been getting out. I mean, we've seen a vast increase in the number of people walking in the UK. In fact, footpaths that would normally just be uh, me suddenly have become motorways because there's so many people out there walking, uh, which I think is good because I think they'll then go back into the work context with a greater sense of scale, uh, connectedness, and a bit more humility about their own ability to control the world. Mm -hmm. How can organizations, I mean, our employers, um, get your message and, and sort of in the new normal, let's say the after COVID period, if there is one, <laughs> one <day. laughs> um, what would be your message, you know, to, the to our employers to, to to make sure that we don't come back to our yeah. previous habits. It's the same sort of advice I've always felt inclined to offer, which is be interested in what works. Um, don't presume that you know or force people to fit into what you think should be happening, but just watch the, you know, most organizations have two parallel universes. One is the org chart and the technical systems and the, the, the job title and all that sort of stuff and the other one is the networks of people who trust each other who talk to each other who meet after work or over coffees or whatever um, and the two rub along uh, alongside each other and what originally excited me so much about the potential for social tools in the workplace was that it enabled the, the informal network to be visible be more effective to have increasing opportunities to try to maybe supplant some of the, the more rigid informal stuff so I think, and that trained me, that taught me to be curious about what was working. You know, I'd watch this network of 20 odd thousand people all talking away to each other and think, oh, that's interesting. Why, why are they talking about that? Or why is that becoming a problem? Or what if we got those two people to talk to each other? Would this become better? And, and so I think that management by being interested, as I, as I used to call it, uh, and especially in this circumstance where so many people have learned to adapt and take responsibility. And I think, you know, in terms of returning, I think there will be a lot of people who have missed the physical presence of an office, the structure of an office, the regimen of, of time it helps some people. I'm not negating that by any stretch. But I think an awful lot of other people have thought, well, why would I want to spend three hours a day commuting in trains full of people with diseases I haven't even thought of yet to sit in front of my computer trying to look busy in front of my boss? You know, I'm not doing that anymore, you know? That's uh, a bit like a question which I raised on Twitter over the weekend, actually, because uh, I realized that about two years ago, um, we had run a workshop where we asked the question uh, about um, if there were no more physical meetings, what would mm. you miss? And, mm. uh, and then the answers were interesting. And it was indeed the informal networking that that was the thing which people, you know, just casual, uh, random conversations. So that these were the yeah. sorts of things which people people were saying that they they would miss. But nobody nobody came forward and said, "Oh, I really missed the meeting." Uh, <laughs> this, this... <laughs> well, I've what's been ashamed to some extent is that we we sort of replicated our dysfunctional meeting culture in Zoom, you know. And and for some of us who've been around this, these tools for a long time, there are so many many more opportunities for asynchronous conversational slack or whatever other ways of keeping in touch with each other and talking to each other about doing stuff and yet people have been subjected to end-to-end -end zoom meetings without even the break of getting up and walking around and having a coffee 
exactly indeed one of the responses was i miss being able to stretch my legs in between <laughs> meetings oh, and, uh, but I uh, but yeah i mean th there is this whole idea that you're also mentioning about <clears throat> Uh, and I've seen in other articles about the difference between a know-it-all culture and a learn-it-all culture and yeah. also the learning organization. And, and there, is a, there is an idea that the sort of the learning and development, I mean, we speak from a certain bias here because we're both, <laughs> Julie and I, from the learning and development part of the organization. But there, there, there has been a lot of um, uh, articles uh, in this period since the pandemic saying that now is the opportunity for learning and development departments to come more to the fore and be more central precisely mm -hmm. because of first of all the the automation that you're referring to earlier um, but also because of the the need for these types of um, skills of like creativity and uh, uh, and systems thinking and so on which have really not been so important up until now, perhaps in many organisations. Would you yep. agree with that? Yes, I mean, I, I'm, I've been very fortunate over the over the years to be engaged by learning and development groups, HR groups, technology groups, whatever. So I get to perceive, see things through their, their perspectives in, in organisations. And with each of the groups, I, I worry about what I call the perils of professionalisation, that, that <clears throat> having become a professional communicator, you sort of, stop communicating and having been a professional learner you stop learning you know in, in the sense that the thing becomes an end in itself and I think we have to be very wary of that in, in organizational life but I do think and, and I, I love phrases like lifelong learning you know what's the alternative <laughs> just get this up stage like well that's it now. I'm full I'm learning nothing more um nonsense you know I, I, but I think <clears throat> cultivating a sense of curiosity and inquisitiveness and playfulness. I mean, this has frustrated me over the years about tools, but I love tinkering and just the, that's why I'm using the beta of iOS 15. I love finding out the new cool stuff that I can do and will sort of just learn it at a rate of knots. There are other people who wonder why their phone keeps doing things to them. You know, so, so I think cultivating that confidence, courage, playfulness, curiosity with everything, with technology, but with systems, with people is, is the biggest task and it goes back to what Julie was saying earlier that it's that getting away from the idea that anything that's not happening in a predicted sequence of events is dysfunctional it's just different it's interesting why, why is that happening why do we feel uncomfortable about it what might be the benefits of keep staying with this discomfort for a bit you know so one of the things we saw again with the social network inside the BBC was that there was an early inclination to sit on anything that was troubling and as soon as somebody raised a potentially contentious topic you could feel every manager in the business twitching wanting to switch the bloody thing off but but we learned just to sit with it and be uncomfortable for a bit and then people would start to come in and different voices would begin to emerge and reason would be collectively decided out of what and we ended up getting somewhere we'd never have got to if we hadn't if we hadn't had the discomfort in the first place and then had the com, com, you know the confidence to live with it for a bit you know, I, I, I read a book uh, recently from uh, Anna Haren, um, Hannah Aaron, sorry, uh, about right. the freedom to, to think, which I, I find really, really fascinating uh, in today's uh, times. And yeah. uh, what she said is that, um, in a way, from, you know, her research on the, um, um, the, the Second World War um, yeah. situation, she saw that the, the main problem was obedience yeah totally and uh, and it's usually the, 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 the it's the new criminals you know they say that but we obey the rules so we are mm -hmm. right you know mm -hmm. and especially for civil servants it's very strong you know this notion of obedience yeah. yeah um so i wanted to ask you this question about should we push people to disobey <laughs> well push, pushing people's got got me going already um so I think all we have the right to do is behave differently ourselves and have the confidence to do that. And so things like <clears throat> in my last year at the BBC, uh, I, my assistant was really good. She didn't sign me up for any real meetings. 
um, you know, the meetings where people sit around a table with notebooks and it's an hour because the software says it has to be and we're not quite sure why we're there, but nobody says it. <clears throat> and I put up with it for 10 minutes and eventually stood up and said, look, I'm really sorry. <clears throat> I don't mean to be disrespectful or rude, but this isn't achieving anything um, and left. And just the faces, the jaws dropping around the room that I'd had the temerity to say this, but they all knew I was right, you know. Um, so I think all we have, well, the most potent way to, to, to bring about change is to be, you know, be the change, be different. Um, and not aggressively, not destructively. Um, you know, that's why anarchism got such a bad name, because in the 20s, they did a few daft things like bumping off some heads of state that got them into trouble. But it was then demonized and, and, and a, a systematic program was put in place to basically say that anything that wasn't the state or organized or conforming was destructive, which is nonsense. And... You know, most people are most, you know, I used to find it funny when people would worry about this network we put in at the BBC and managers would say to me, well, what if they end up causing trouble or wasting time or whatever? And I said, well, who, who employed these troublemaking morons in the first place? You know, <laughs> it was you, you know, um, trust them. And, and, and they're grown up and they're at work and they know the limits. You don't have to worry about them, you know. I'm hearing, or, or, or if you do, if, 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 if there's the odd nutter who is causing trouble, you get to find out who they are and you sack them. I, I'm hearing a call for leadership, for leadership in, in each other. I mean, each one of us, yeah. distributed yeah. leadership. Totally, yes, and and yeah, again, there's so many words that we just can't use anymore. But um, yes, that self awareness. And authenticity, I can't, authenticity, there I go. Um, having spent enough time sitting quietly in a room on your own to understand your own demons and your own proclivities, such that you don't indulge them at work. Uh, some some well-placed psychotherapy for senior people would be worth so much more than a new technology system. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um... It's just, you, I mean, when we, you say it, it's positive leadership. We, we don't want to, to challenge the system even more. In a, I mean, not challenge, but block it in a way. We, we should be a force for, you know, finding the, the solutions, um, yeah. building well, well, the, the technologies yeah. that we need for the future to, to, to solve, not to solve our issues, but, but really to improve our well-being. Um, yes. In context, uh, yes. as you say. So, would you have any advice from your own experience as a leader um, for 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 those emerging leaders, the, the people that know they have a leadership inside of them, but in a way they were sort of not letting him it emerge because they thought it was not allowed. Um, yes. What would be your advice to these people? Well, funnily enough, I was just remembering my last few years at the BBC where I had a very good boss who realised that I didn't need him to tell me what to do. Um, I just needed him to give me a bit of energy, a bit of context, uh, keep the hierarchy off me while I did what I had to do. And remembering being at a local outdoor pool um, and remembering to move away from the pool so that he couldn't hear the the splashing and the giggling when he when he phoned me and um, so that I didn't scare him too much <laughs> but he knew that I did what I was meant to be doing and very often faster than most people because I wasn't faffing around in the office or pretending to be busy or going to meetings that I didn't need to go to I would deliver um, and so I think that building trust with the people who you you know there's no point in scaring your boss or or becoming known as a troublemaker. And, and we all learn a way to do that dance. Um, and so much of it is, is around intent. You know, if my intent was to get away with things or to be destructive or get my own back or blah, 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 it, I, it, I'd have been out of my ear really quickly. But because Gareth understood that my intention was to try and make things better, to improve the context and work and, and, and whatever else, then he, he trusted me. Um, so I think intent and trust are huge, um, which are easy words to bandy around and they're misused all the time. Well, certainly trust is. 
you know, so if, if you see yet you know, another slide or another poster on the wall talking about trust, run away, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's not how it happens. Yeah. It seems like communication is a key ingredient um, from what I'm hearing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at risk of finding fault with every word you use at the moment, Julie, but I, th but I think, so c communication becomes a thing as well. Um, and it fascinates me how it ever became seen as a Honest separate communication thing. communication. Well, Honest. just talking to each other, you know? I mean, no, nothing happens without us talking to each other, yeah. ever. You know, it, and it's funny, again, how senior people will think, oh, well, I have a communications person who does that. I'm no, too no, scared no, no. to talk to anybody. Yeah. No, just talk to them. Yeah. Listen, yeah, well, exactly. well, well, let's listen to them, maybe more than talk to them, but you know, just, just I nearly said the word engage, but you can't use that either because that's become engagement, you know. Mm. No, no, you're right, it's not professional communication I was talking about, it's just the you know, honest conversations, having honest yeah. conversations with, yeah, yeah. with anyone in the organization, whether at the top or at the bottom. Or... So, it's, it's very ungracious of me to find fault with the words that are being used by somebody who's not a native English speaker who's speaking English better than I do. Before we moved into the dreaming big for Europe, which was that oh. what you were um, what you were summarising, uh, you and I think, uh, also because of the, the 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 terminology, and I'm a native English speaker as well. But what I've seen uh, is that we tend to use these words because that's what the organisation refers to and understands, and yes. quite often the perhaps the issue is really that. We we have made it so uh, formalized in you know, talking about instead of talk to that person, you have to yeah. communicate or you have to <laughs> engage with that person. Yeah. Uh, you know, use use big words with multiple syllables where something simple yeah. would do. Yeah. That that maybe that's actually getting in the way of normal uh, human interaction. Yeah, and and. I was going to say aggressively, so that's maybe overstating it. But it's a bit like when I got my first management job and, and I was horrified at this prospect of, you know, even the word being responsible for is nonsense because these were 50 people, some of whom were old enough to be my dad who'd been working at the BBC before I was born and suddenly I was meant to be making decisions on their behalf. And to protect myself from the horror of this, I used to, I, I started wearing a tie and talking funny is how I describe it. And, and thankfully, I realised that that was a slippery slope. But but many people don't, and so they keep they, they keep in that mode of wearing the uniform and talking funny as as a protection against the horror of being in charge. So then, so then let's let's move on to your your dream for Europe. What should just, what? just being allowed back in would be enough. <laughs> Apart from that, if we can move on for, you know, what, what would you be allowed back into? That's the, what, what should that be? What should that look like? Really interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I, you know, Europe is just a story. You know, any, any nation is just a story. The, the, and I find this more fascinating in mainland Europe as well, where the borders are just made up lines and sand. I mean, there's nothing that makes one bit Germany and another bit France. It's, it's a bit madness. Um, so we choose to take those stories seriously or not, as the case may be. Um, and I certainly think in terms of the way we organize finances and, and um, I've just forgotten Stephen's name. Quest. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of the conversation with Stephen about, you know, the tax borders and, and, and managing those borders and things are fascinating, just about how we manifest difference and the point of difference and whether we benefit or don't benefit from difference or how much we need difference in structure. Going back to the thing about the boundaries of work and the boundaries of a nation and the boundaries of Europe. Um, and, and, and it's sort of a consistent thing from what we've been talking about is the, the degree to which we take those seriously or not and how much they become limiting factors or not or how much they become part of our identity or not. And watching some of the sort of high level bickering between heads of state over national type identities and thinking, well, but in a globally connected internet world, that's nonsense. You know, the servers are all over the place. Having one set of laws 
applying them. You know, so the, the, the issue with China and what, what's what's acceptable within their geographical boundaries when the servers are all over the blooming place. You know, so um, back to the consistent theme of, of this again, I think that the the willingness to be curious about some of this and think. creatively and, and 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 each of us thinking not just deferring it to somebody who's in charge or somebody senior or a politician or a body of authority of some sort or another but thinking well what what's the optimal story or set of stories that we could use and not just Europe you know Europe might be helpful in so many ways but could be constricting in others because it becomes a thing and that thing then becomes an end in itself and becomes something that people like us are now excluded from. You know, it's, it's, it's stopping making up silly stories would be a good thing. But who gets to decide what's silly and what's not? That's the problem. Yeah, it's really a global movement that we need. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's about this feeling of separate, you know, the whole idea of the separate self and the separate I and the separate me and the separate family and the team and blah, blah, blah. Is, is, is nonsense. We're all exchanging cells with the planet all the blooming time, you know, going back to the nature thing. We're not separate. Um, we're completely interlinked with everything, including each other. And the sooner we realize that and make decisions on the basis of that, rather than thinking we can get away with being a wee shit, the better. Yeah, this interconnectedness is very important. It's, it reminds me of um, um, the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. um, story about emptiness mm -hmm. uh, that we don't exist on our own and I think yes. it's a very beautiful uh, conclusion probably to uh, to this conversation you and um, that we need well, to, I, I, uh, to use technologies to complete ourselves yes. and not to replace yes us. totally yes yes I mean we've got I mean we have an incredible opportunity in that we have a very suitable technology in the form of the internet to enable us to manifest that worldview that is increasingly understood and prevalent. And that's where I think the next big story will be, will be that interconnectedness. And the fact that you know, emptiness isn't a negative thing, it just means pre-conceptual, it just means open and flexible and, and, and the state of nature before things manifest. And so, <clears throat> being more comfortable in that space and, and 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 allowing things to emerge and then taking action. It's not passive. It's not hippy dippy. Let the world be the way it is. It's you still take action, but you take it from a place of grounded, connected confidence. And you know, a lot of this is because we fear death and we fear a negative impact on our on ourselves, so we protect ourselves. Um, and it's in that fear and that sense of protection that we end up dysfunctional and we end up behaving and, and acting in ways that cause ourselves and the planet untold harm. Yeah, you, you helped us uh, write, continue writing the dream to data. Thank you so much, <laughs> uh, uh, Ewan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.